Hello and thank you so much for joining me today for this thought from the Bible coming to you today from inside my house because it is absolutely pouring with rain outside, definitely in the rainy season here in West Africa right now. But today I wanted to explore what I think is possibly one of the strangest stories that we find in the Bible and it just so happens to occur in the life of the prophet Elisha, this man who we've been exploring for a few weeks now, just digging into some of the, the miracles that happened throughout his life and what they tell us about God, what we can learn from them to apply to our own lives. So this is how it goes from 2 Kings chapter 2. It says from there, from Jericho, where Elisha was the last time we read about him, from there Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. I'm sorry, what? Bears came out of the woods and mauled a group of boys. This must be one of the strangest kind of miracle type events recorded in the Bible, right? And it's really peculiar on first glance. I mean, it's downright horrible on first glance. It seems like, from just reading it briefly like that, that a group of kids come running out, laugh at Elisha for being bold, insult, insult him just a little bit. And so he calls down a curse on them and bears run out of the woods and attack them. Right, why is this in the Bible? Why did this happen? What does this mean? Do we serve a God who would allow children to be attacked by bears for a couple of insults? You know, it's very easy to like read through this part of the Bible and kind of read a story like this and be like, uh, that's a little bit weird. I'm not sure I like that one, but I'm just gonna skim past and carry on to the next part. But I think it's so important for us not to ignore those parts of the Bible that are maybe a little bit more difficult to understand, maybe a little bit harder to, to get something out of. Because when we do dig into this story, when we do understand it a little bit better, there is actually much more to what we read on the surface here. For one, our English translations of the Bible can sometimes be a little bit mixed. I mean, it is amazing that we have the Bible in English and in so many different and rich translations, but just occasionally, English doesn't quite pick up on the nuances of the original languages that the Bible was written in, Hebrew and Greek. If you read this passage, for example, in the original King James version of the Bible, you would be mortified because it describes that group of mockers as being little children, little children attacked by bears for insulting a man. That's not great. But actually, there are two Hebrew words used to describe this mob, and they can be translated in different ways. The first word, naha, can mean children or boys. Yes, it's true, but it can also mean servant. And there are uses of this word denoting the baby Moses, absolutely, a young child, but also all the way up to the fully grown man, Absalom. And the second word used in this passage, katan, can mean small or young, but it can also mean insignificant or unimportant. And once again, it's used to describe characters in the Bible who are older. For example, Solomon, when he takes the throne of Israel at the age of 20, he, that word is used to describe him. 
because he considers himself not wise enough for the task ahead of him. So the likely meaning of the words within this passage suggests that this mob was made up of at least 42 young-ish men who were probably inexperienced servants, maybe untrained men. And Bethel, where Elisha was or where he was going to, was one of the locations where the former king of Israel, Jeroboam, had set up two golden calves for the people to worship, drawing them away from the true almighty God. And it's possible because of the words used, some Bible scholars suggest that this group of young men may actually have been unofficial priests or helpers working at that very shrine. Suddenly the story starts to take on a bit of a different meaning, right? These men are insulting Elisha. They are calling him bold, something that's fairly uncommon in Israel, something that may have denoted uncleanness, uncleanliness, and they are telling him to get out of here. Perhaps to leave this specific place, get out of Bethel, yeah, maybe, but perhaps casting doubt on his succession from Elijah. Get out of here, Elisha. You're not God's spokesperson. We don't care about you. You should just give up on this task. You should just accept that the people here are happy worshiping a golden statue. We don't care about your God anymore. Get out of here. They're not just insulting Elisha in this moment. They are insulting almighty God. And if you've read through the Old Testament, you've likely heard of the place Bethel. See, it was a place of significance within the Old Testament. Bethel literally means house of God. House of God. It was where Jacob had had that dream, seeing angels ascending and descending on a ladder to heaven, where he said, God is in this place, and I didn't realize it. It was near to the place where Abram first pitched his tents when he arrived in the promised land and worshipped God there. The house of God had been overtaken by covenant-breaking, idolatrous worship. And Elisha, perhaps traveling there to speak of the Lord Almighty, to try and turn people's hearts back to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, was having a mob of young people attempt to chase him out. He was being chased out of the house of God, where these people were instead worshiping foreign gods and idols. But even in that situation, and even with Elisha having all that knowledge, you'll note in this account that this isn't exactly what Elisha prays for. He doesn't ask for this specific outcome. We're told that he calls down a curse in the name of the Lord, but the outcome is determined by God. Two bears come lumbering out of the woods and maul, not necessarily kill, but maul 42 of the crowd. And to me, that suggests that there may have been many more than 42, because I can't imagine those young men just standing still as the bears come out. I think they'd have been running, trying to escape. For 42 of them to have been caught by two bears, it suggests a bigger crowd than that. But you see, Elisha didn't pray, Lord, come and kill my enemies right now. He left the outcome in God's hands. He turned that crowd of young men over to the Lord. And so I think this story is a, a good reminder to us that whatever is going on in our lives, no matter how fierce the opposition may seem, we can commit everything to God and trust it into his hands. See, Elisha, he didn't run away, though that perhaps would have been the most obvious 
course of action, get myself out of danger, get out of this sticky situation, run away, forget what I was supposed to be doing in this place. He didn't turn around and shout at the crowd. He didn't panic. He didn't scream insults at anyone. He didn't take to social media and start berating the people who held different opinions to him. It's easy for us to have those kind of reactions today, I think. But instead, Elisha gave it all to God. And we can do the same in our own lives. We can trust God with the hard situations we go through. We can trust him with the insults. We can trust him with the hurt. That is the best thing that we can do. Not calling down curses, perhaps, but being honest with God and saying, Lord, this hurts and I don't know what to do, but I'm going to leave it all with you. I'm going to trust it into your hands. Everything in my life is safe in your hands. But even with all of that knowledge, it's still a strange story, right? Even looking at the, the historical and linguistical background, it's still peculiar. It's still hard for us to understand. It seems a million miles away from the teaching of Jesus, of turn the other cheek and, and love your, your enemy. And that can be hard for us to, to put that together, to understand this story. But you know, one thing it does show us is how absolutely passionate God is for his people. Because this, this group, this mob, they were telling Elisha, the prophet of God Almighty, to get out of that place, to effectively stop doing his ministry of trying to bring people back to God Almighty. Not to mention the fact that Israel was supposed to be a nation that was going to bless all other nations on earth. Israel was supposed to bring all people to God Almighty. And instead, we find this group worshipping foreign gods, worshipping idols, having the opposite impact of what they were supposed to achieve. That doesn't necessarily help us in understanding it entirely, but it does just give us a hint for God's passionate justice, for his desperate desire for all people to know him and to know his love for them. You know, there are many moments as we read through the Old Testament that can be hard for us to understand today. It's true. And I think it's okay for us to wrestle with those passages, to wrestle with scripture, to ask questions, to ponder why a, a certain story or section of the Bible is included. God has given us brains. He's given us the capacity to reason and to think through these stories. So I would love to hear from you. Is there anything else that you get out of this story? Is there anything that you think I'm wrong about? That's fine too. Let's talk about this. We can discuss these passages and try and work them through together to give us a little bit more understanding, to give us that depth, that richness of understanding of the whole of the Bible from beginning all the way through to the end. So thank you so much for joining me today for that thought from the Bible. I'm sorry it's a little bit longer than normal, but there was a lot to dig in there with that the historical and the linguistical elements of this story. But I hope that there was some encouragement in that for you, maybe some kind of a challenge to really dig into God's word for yourself as well and see what nuggets of wisdom, what elements of truth you can find in this incredible, incredible book. So I'll be back on Wednesday next week, discovering the next little part of the life of the prophet Elisha, and I will see you then.